This evening's discussion will be Yachin Yurai. And slide, and just leave it there. And Yachin Yurai is the image that we have in our Hondo. And the image in our Hondo is the one that you see on the left with it says Junzen Tendaiji. And the reason I have these two images is because um, throughout Asia, you'll see two styles of the medicine Buddha, Yakshin Yurai Vajiga uh, Guru, that is the Sanskrit term for this. And the typically you'll see the image which is seated, which is the one that's on the right. And that particular image is from Ryoji in Nara. And just to give you some context for this, that's considered one of the earliest uh, carved Buddha images in Japan uh, by the Japanese. There were several that were brought from Korea and China. And um, Ariyoji is considered the oldest uh, extant wooden building in the world being built in the, in the seventh century. And it's still standing, hadn't, hadn't been burned down. And um, that image that you see there is considered one of the first carved images in Japan. And that, that probably gives you a clue as to how important this image uh, was over time. And one of the reasons that, and, and the one on Jians and Tandaiji on the left-hand side, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and by the way, when that image came to us, uh, it's now, what, uh, 17 years ago. That image was in a cabinet, and which many images in Japan are, many, many sculptures are in cabinet that you would open uh, periodically. But I decided to take Yakshin Yorai out of the closet and uh, display him without being confined. So uh, that's... That image, as you see him now, is when he was in the cabinet. Um, but I also wanted to tell you a little bit about why Yachi Nurai was chosen for our Hondo. Um, and then we'll go on to the material that you see in the handout. <clears throat> and the image, so that you know, the image um, was completed in 2005. Uh, our Hondo. Well, let me, let me go back a little bit further. Um, our temple, Tendai Buddhist Institute, current Tendai Dharma Center, had started in 1995, and we had been sitting in a barn, a horse barn, literally a third of one of the horse barns. We had two barns on the property at that time, a horse barn and a cow barn, and we'd been sitting in one third of the, of the horse barn. In the wintertime, it was so cold this time of the year that even though we had a really enormous wood stove tucking along, the water in the offering bowls was frozen throughout the service. That's how cold it was in the hondo. And there was so much wind that we had carpet on the floor, and the floor would just wave like waves in the ocean while we were sitting there. And but in uh, 2000, the Jigyodan, the Tendai Overseas Charitable Foundation, had visited our temple, had visited Kuru Tendai Dharma Center, and without going into a lot of detail, they determined that they would like to make um, this center, the Betsuin, the branch of Enrakuji, uh, in North America, the head temple for North America. And so in order to do that, well, not in order to do that, but because of that, they felt that we needed a more appropriate hondo, more appropriate temple building, main building. And so they financed the, and actually when I say they, I should be more specific because I, I think there is not enough gratitude going around that the they had appealed to the temples in Japan to donate money for the renovation of our temple. And so, our temple was not paid by Yezon or Enrakuji directly. It was paid for through the efforts of the Jigyodan to 
uh, have many, many, many temples in Japan contribute to the building of our of our uh, structure. And so we had then chosen, and if you read the latest uh, Shingi, you'll read about some of the measures that we took to ensure that that structure was environmentally uh, sustainable. And we renovated a horse barn um, that started with taking it down piece by piece by hand in 2004, and finally completed in June of 2005. And the image on the left, Jiyunsen Tendaiji, um, actually, and I'll, I'll tell the story of that, came to us because the Jiyodan said, well, what should be the, the Honzon? What should be the main image in the temple? And it did, I didn't really have to think about it very much. And I didn't have to think about it on, on several levels. One of which was that they had asked the question, uh, Shortly after 9-11, the, the, uh, the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York City. And so recognizing that Iazon and Enrakuji is to the northeast, or excuse me, it's, it's in the north of Kyoto to protect Kyoto, to guard Tokyo, um, so to, to guard Kyoto. And at that time, I thought that it would be one symbolic way of demonstrating the position of the New York Betsuin would be by having Dakshin Yorai, the healing Buddha, as the main image, as a showing of healing that the US needed to undergo at that time. But at the same time, the, that image that you see, Jyonzen Tendaiji, is flanked on the right by Yakshin Yorai Kenobasatsu, which is the deity of compassion, which certainly we needed much of at the time. And on the left-hand side is um, Vishamonten, which was the Honzon at Tamunin. Tamunin, the, the term Tamunin is a different pronunciation of the word Vishamonte, same character, but different pronunciation. So Vishamonte, or the guardian from the north, and, and uh, Yakshin Yorai as the Honzon, and then to the right is Kenobasatsu, which is the deity of compassion. So that's why we, that's the reason I gave for having um, those images there. And, but furthermore, it's really important to recognize that Saicho himself carved many images, and as you'll, you'll learn in a few minute, minutes, carved many images of the Medicine Buddha, of Yakshin Yorai, Vajiga Guru, and in so doing, set the stage for many of those, that style of Buddha image to be uh, installed into temples all over Japan, especially within uh, Tendai, Tendai Buddhism, but, but many other forms of Buddhism. Now, keep in mind that that first image that you see from Hiroji was not Tendai. That, that preceded Tendai by several hundred years, uh, the, the, the temple as well as the image. So the notion of the medicine Buddha was already important in Japan. Saicho further popularized it. As, as time went on. So we had, on one hand, we chose it because of its symbolic meaning in relation to what was happening in America at that time. Another aspect had to do with um, the representation of the Medicine Buddha in Tendai. And then the third reason was, I'm a biomedical anthropologist. <laughs> and it just seemed like um, an affinity that I had for the healing Buddha. So I would say that, that we, uh, the Honzon at our temple was there for three distinct reasons, not just one or, or just two. Pandemic. I did know the pandemic was coming, but I, I try not to, to brag about that, you know, because for various reasons. Yeah. Um, however, 
So why don't we, so that, that's, and, and if people have some questions about that, write them down and I'll answer them when we, when we uh, get to the question and answer portion of, of this evening. And, and I'm gonna go through this handout fairly quickly because it's obviously you can read it. Um, the first paragraph there, I'm just mentioning the, um, the names that are given. And I'll, I'll point out that uh, the medicine teacher as Yakshi literally means is Lord of the Eastern paradise of the pure lapis lazuli. And keep in mind that, that Amida is the Lord of the Western paradise of the pure land. So they stand in a position to one another. And, and part of the mythology of that is that the medicine Buddha cares for those uh, within this realm and the Amida cares for those in the next realm. That's the way it's often portrayed. Um, and I mentioned in here that, that the worship of the medicine Buddha first developed in Central Asia. You don't find representations of the medicine Buddha in India. Well, to begin with, in India, you find primarily Shakyamuni Buddha anyway, but you will find um, because of, of late Nikaya, early Mahayana, you will find um, Avalokitesvara and Manjushri and other, and other images, but you probably will not find a medicine Buddha per se. That's not to say that, that in the Pali Canon, well, to begin with, in the Pali Canon, you don't find a reference to the medicine Buddha. There's a great um, reliance upon medicine as a whole. And there are rituals that revolved around medicine in the Pali Canon, but you don't find the image of, of, Yakshi, of the medicine Buddha, Bajaga Guru. And so we, we know that it came from Central Asia originally and was transmitted from the third, late third century CE. It was transmitted along the Silk Road. And we find that it, it not only gets into Asia, uh, East Asia, but it also goes into Tibet and it goes into um, Korea, China, all throughout uh, uh, Asia. And you even find images in Cambodia and especially in Vietnam. Vietnam, there's, there's quite a, a reliance upon the medicine Buddha also. And according to Mark, Mark Schumacher, uh, Matsunami Kodo, and I'll just read this, wrote, because a mantra associated with Bajagaguru refers to the daughter of a clan that lived in Northern Asia, it's been suggested that this Buddha originated not in India, but among nomadic tribes in Northern or Central Asia and was later incorporated into Buddhism. So it's not unlikely that the image and the worship of the image existed and was one of those things that occurred where there was a synchrony between the image and Buddhism. And so it was incorporated at a later time. Now, Buddhism arrived in Japan in the sixth century from, uh, from Pachike and, and China. And Yashi was among the first to arrive. And he quickly became revered, as I say here, uh, as a powerful deity who could cure earthly sufferings. And when I say earthly sufferings, I don't want people to assume that I mean physical illness. And I'll be talking more about that in a little bit. That's not to say that, that people did not revere Yakshi Nirai in Japan or in the rest of Asia uh, for as a, as a curative figure. If, if one had a, well, there, there's, there's a temple near uh, Taisho Degaku, Taisho University that I would often pass when I was going to Taisho University. And once a month, I think it was on a Tuesday, uh, I knew what day it was because the train would be filled with elderly people with canes and, and other devices going to that particular temple for a healing <laughs> because of the Buddha image that was in that particular temple. So it's not to say that, that people didn't look at Yakshin Yorai for physical healing, but I don't want people to get the impression that it's only that, but I'll talk about that more a little bit later. Um, it, the initial exposure to the master of healing 
are is really found in three primary sutras and then in a number of other a number of other areas. Uh, and they describe the powers of the Buddha, the methods of properly invoking the deity, and the rituals that go along with that, and the benefits to be gained, mostly again from curing uh, earthly illnesses. Now, I said before that it's found, you'll find the, the image both seated and standing. Uh, early on in most of Asia, you'll see a seated image with the hand in the, what the Japanese call the, the, the right hand would be up in Semuin uh, uh, Mudra. And in the left hand is one of several different um, objects. In some cases, it's a <laughs> bowl holding a uh, kampo, which is uh, Chinese herbal medicines. In other cases, it's considered a jewel, a healing jewel. Um, and that speaks to the attributes of the healing Buddha. Um, often in temples in throughout Asia and especially in Japan, you'll find that the statue, the Yakshin Yorai, will be surrounded by 12 figures who represent 12 generals. And each of those generals has a particular quality that's associated with it. In other cases, you'll see that it's flanked by two figures, Nikko and Gakko. Nikko representing sunlight Buddha and Gakko representing moonlight Buddha. So it represents the, the, those two images in some cases. Now, in this particular image that we see from uh, Horayuji, that I think there's what seven, seven figures that are, are surrounding the uh, royal. And I'm not actually sure what those are, just for, go ahead. I was gonna, I was gonna ask actually, do you think that, I know there's the seven medicine Buddha sutra, mm -hmm. but since there's seven, it may be one. That, that, may, be, that, may, be, oh, yeah. that may be one of them, yeah. But I'm not, I'm not sure I didn't do any research on that particular, that particular image. Um, typically, in temples that have Yakshinirai, the 12th of every month is dedicated to Yakshinirai. And this is often accompanied by reading the 25th chapter of Lotus Sutra, which of course is the medicine chapter. Um, and there's a long-standing tradition of appealing to the medicine Buddha to heal diseases. And this is best put in the context of physical, mental, which now, especially now, even um, allopathic medicine recognizes that those two things, both mental, medical, physical illnesses and mental illnesses are interrelated. And also spiritual illnesses and the Yakshin Yurai rituals address each of these. And I think it's important to, to recognize that. So there's a, the, the, the idea, in spite of the joke that I made or the, the, the observation, the vignette of seeing all these older people limping to the temple on the Tuesdays, every Tuesday of the month uh, to have their knee or their shoulder or whatever. <laughs> um, Relieved of pain. Yakshin Yurai and the sutras talk about the Buddha in relation to what I'll, I'll mention here is both physical ailments, i.e., one has a bad knee, or mental illnesses. And we have to remember that, and I'll mention this again in a second, many mental illnesses were seen as a form of spiritual illness. And, and then spiritual in the sense that by invoking the benefits of Yakshi Nyurai, one can improve one's practice, one's Buddhist practice. So it's, it's seen, it's to remove the hindrances that one may have from one's Buddhist practice. So from a purely Buddhist perspective, physical, mental, and spiritual dis-ease are really indistinct from each other. You know, we look at them and we say, and, and understandably so, 
we look at someone and we say someone has a gallbladder problem. And that is without a doubt a physical illness. That's a physical problem. From a Buddhist perspective, the gallbladder problem was not just because of whatever ideology we might think of for a bad gallbladder, that there's a spiritual component in that, meaning specifically karmic. And so karma was often seen as one of the things which uh, resulted in, in causing physical, psychological, mental, as well as spiritual problems. The four requisites for living, according to the Holy <coughs> Canon, are robes, food, lodging, and medicine. And so medical healing was a significant practice to many of the early monks, and some monk physicians used healing as a means of reading the Dharma. Um, the healing process was seen as spiritual growth. And a re reference to that is seen by a, in, in a Pali canon where there's a story of Shakyamuni Buddha asking one of his senior disciples, I believe it was Shariputra, it might have been uh, Mokliana, um, why there were so many new adherents coming to his discourses. Why were there so many people? All of a sudden, there were just hundreds of people showing up, thousands of people showing up, whereas previously there might have been tens of people showing up or 50 people showing up. All of a sudden, there were so many more. And the disciple recounted to him that, well, many of the people were now joining the Sangha because so many of the monks were healers and they were joining the Sangha to be healed. And Shakyamuni Buddha admonished uh, the disciple and said, no, we're not here to heal physical problems. We're here, here to heal spiritual problems. And so joining the Sangha as a, a form of, of health insurance, <laughs> if you will, is, is not really what we're here for. If they want to join the Sangha because they're looking for um, spiritual, for awakening, for enlightenment, that's a good reason. But don't do it because they, you know, they're having a, a problem with their knee, so to speak. Um, in the Tibetan medical system, it's really interesting because the primary works, and, and by the way, the healing Buddha, Vajagar Guru, is very, very popular in Tibetan medicine. He's a major figure. And I'm, I'm sorry. And yes, he is very popular in Tibetan medicine, but he's also popular in Tibetan religion as a whole, Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and so he's, he's often found, there are many images of him found in, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and in the, the Tibetan medical system, there are four primary works on medicine. They're referred to as the four tantras. And of the four tantras, one of the, and, and these are dedicated to the medicine Buddha. And one of the four tantras, I should say three of the four tantras are specifically dealing with um, spiritual concerns. Three of the four volumes deal specifically with, with spiritual concerns, including things like how to get rid of demons. You know, um, when they show up, only one of the four volumes of Tibetan medicine deals what we what, what we would think of as physical issues. In other words, what to do when a person has a cough, what to do when a person has a fever, that sort of thing. Um, so keep in mind that spiritual also addresses what we think of as psychological homoneuroses. That's also a spiritual issue. From this, from the or psychoses or any other, you know, or any other psychological disorder, um, that's often was the context to which healing was applied. And so, I have down here the the two mantras that are used in one in Sanskrit and one in Japanese <laughs> that are used for uh, appealing, asking the assistance of Yakshin Yorai or the medicine. Buddha. Um, and we're going to be, when we do the um, meditation tonight, I'm actually going to use, I've got material for you to use, 
I'm actually going to use the formal meditation that is done with uh, the Medicine Buddha. And I just wanted to point out to you that the first time that I read that formal meditation that was used, and I, I read it probably the first time, it must have been maybe 40 years ago, something like that. And the first time I read it, the thing that amazed me most was it was almost identical in many ways to a visualization meditation that I was given uh, to give to patients by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And I, I, I never, I, I had met Elizabeth Kubler-Ross back in the early 70s, uh, did workshops with her. And I had never had an opportunity to ask her uh, if that's where she had gotten that particular visualization. But I found that really remarkable that she used, a, she didn't use the term medicine Buddha. She herself was not a Buddhist. Uh, and, but it's really interesting how she had given us that meditation to use for hospice patients who were in a great deal of pain. It was almost identical to the one that she had given us. I had, I'd received it probably, you know, uh, 10 years before that. So. Um, so that's what I've got for the, the presentation this evening. We have some time for some questions and answers if you could go on to the next slide. And I, I played to the lowest um, denominator here because nobody can resist cats. So questions, comments, and thoughts. Could you expand the thing so we can see people? And okay. Mushin. Or, uh, Mushin's in the, behind me here, but I look yeah. back. Um, I, I, re I read uh, uh, a sutra on lapis lazuli, Pratikanta, which talks about uh, you know, uh, seven vows, uh, 12 vows. 12 vows, right. 12 vows. Right. Some of those vows had to do with physical healing, emotional and some had to do with very practical things like shelter mm -hmm. and clothing. Yep. And yeah. So where does that all fit in? I mean, do we it's do we um, call on the Labs Leslie Pentecostal to to heal these different things? I, I think it recognizes that all the things that if you're not well fed, if you're not yeah. well clothed, if you're not well housed, et cetera, et cetera, that all has to do with your physical well being and your psychological well being, obviously. And so I think that that's all part of it. Do people then, it, as part of reciting that that mantra, the mantra we recite every every uh, every day? Om B says A, B says A, B says Ja, somebody, Yate, Swaka. That is, the, well, that's the Japanese version of that. Um, that would be used as part of the appeal to asking for assistance, as well as looking at the image, such as the one that we have in our, in our hondo, looking at the image and realizing that you can take on those qualities of the medicine Buddha. As part of your as part of your body's yeah. Okay. We've got uh, three people here. Okay. Uh, Zenon. Zenon, you have a question. Um. Yeah, I have a couple. Um, I read somewhere that the standing um yakushin yorai was popularized by Dengyu Daishi because he wanted to represent the the Buddha is, you know, proactive. Is that true or? That he wanted to represent, I didn't hear the, the term. And my second question was, why do I, so I, many... I, I'm sorry, sorry? No, I didn't hear the whole question. That you said oh, that sorry. Yeah. The standing Buddha because... Oh, I because... Um, yeah, I meant to say that, if, is it because he wanted to represent that it's more proactive and involved oh, proactive. compared to Nara Buddhism? Yeah. Um, 
I can't I can't respond to that. I don't I don't know if that's the reason he did it or not to be candid with you. Maybe it's a Shima sensei. Uh, do you have a, a response to that? He's oh, uh, you're muted. Sensei. Uh, one moment, sensei, sensei, you're muted. <coughs> hey. um, thank you. Uh, well, um, Yakshinyora is so uh, famous in Japan uh, to heal the healing Buddha medicine. And the, of course, uh, in Nara, Yak Shin Yakshiji is very beautiful statues of uh, all this one in Japan, I think, uh, Yakshin Yorai. And the, uh, when the next Heian period, the Saicho founded uh, Tendai Buddhism, and he wanted to, uh, to save all uh, patient people in Japan. And so at that time, uh, I think uh, pandemics were something uh, very spread it. And they, therefore, he made a, a curved Yakshinyorai uh, at the Mount Hiei. And that, that was the main, main, uh, main Buddha of uh, Hiei-san. And you know, Kompon Chudo, the main building, there is a very oldest statues. And uh, uh, so Yakshinyorai represent the eastern directions. In the western direction is Amitabha Buddha. So, uh, and like that way, uh, so uh, Yakshi and uh, Amitabha are very uh, representing uh, Mount Hiei, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Your, thank you. Questions, you know? um, thank you. Uh, my second question was, I was wondering for some time, why do so many temples, you know, close off their images and only allowed to be seen on like certain days? Well, there, there's, there are different uh, images and some images, they only open up the cabinet to be seen after uh, three years, five years, 13 years, 33 years, 50 years, <laughs> different periods of time. And, and part of the reason for that is because the images themselves are considered sacred in the sense that um, the power the power of the image itself could have a harmful effect on people if they were not properly um, uh, cared for. Um, and maybe Sensei, you would like to, to elaborate on that, why some of the images are in a cabinet for let's say uh, 25 years or 13 years or something along those lines. Well, the Endiaguji uh, also the main Yakshin Yorai carved by Saicho or not open. Uh, uh, and uh, instead, uh, standing statues of the uh, Yakshin Yorai uh, stood, stand uh, just in, uh, in front of, uh, of the uh, se se secret uh, Yakshin Yorai. And why secret? Because I think uh, uh, such a power of uh, mm, uh, uh, nourishing or po power mm. to save people are uh, very important. And so always keeps in mind uh, not to open uh, in public, but the uh, spiritual symbolism is uh, hide it in that way as healing Buddha. Uh, or else, you know, the, even Kanno, Avarokiteisubara, uh, so each 33 years, we open it. So uh, we have uh, Hikarido, a Kannon temple, uh, near our temple. That is opened uh, each, every 33 years. Uh, and uh, so, uh, such a way, uh, such a secret, uh, maybe uh, it's sometimes very important uh, for uh, people to, to believe in Buddhism, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. And, and some yeah. people said, which canon? It's the Bato canon, the horse-headed canon. Right. And so thank you. 
the Bato canon could also be very disturbing for people to look at and if they didn't understand the true significance of it, as well as the power of the image itself. Okay, okay, Zeeland? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry? Therefore, it has to be hidden for 33 years? They open it up once every 33 years. Well, I'll, I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> Uh, Glenn? Glenn, you had your you had your hand up. Yes. Um, actually, um, what uh, Zenon was mentioning, uh, the question, uh, there was the thing about the you know about closing the images, like uh, like when some images are close up doing certain times. Uh, I brought up some other uh, uh, another question also, but uh, first before I get to that, like uh, just a, a, a quick um, I don't know, like just a quick comment or uh, maybe just some. Uh, just some some uh, interesting fact um, about the whole about the concept about like with, with regarding um, ailments illnesses. Um, yeah, you mentioned earlier about like like if someone has like especially for mental illness because I know mental illness is a big uh, it's a big talk right now in uh, in today's world. Um, but I, I remember you mentioned about mental like there was a belief that you know. Um, no, those are like if there was a mental illness, like it could be, it's uh, it's believed that it's you know, you know, it's uh, someone's like possessed by a spirit, something like that. Um, it's uh, it's also that 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 same kind of uh, concept is also uh, true in in, uh, in 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 India also in in uh, Indian in you know in traditions in India also in Tibet also it's also that's also considered uh you know true like you know um like if you have a, if someone has there's a mental illness it's you know it, it's it could be a spirit uh yeah just a quick thing i want to add but um in terms of uh about you know like about those images um being close up during certain times and you mentioned it's because uh sometimes it may be, be a bit too uh, disturbing or just too powerful to to look at, like um, if one is not ready, um, and I know in in Tibet, like in, in many of the Tibetan lineages, there's what you you know, like there's some practices that you cannot do without, like there's there's certain sadhanas that you cannot do without um, receiving empowerment to them. Um, in Japan, um, did they? Would you have to also uh, receive empowerments? Do, do you ever like? Uh, receive empowerments for you know for you know for for looking at the for just to look at these uh, images or even to read certain these certain, certain sutras. Well, it, it's interesting because addressing that specifically, the temple that Ichijima Sensei was talking about that has the Bato Canon, the cabinet is open, but the only people who are permitted to be in the temple at the time are people who are ordained and have received a certain level of training. So it's not open to the public in general. It's only open to those people who um, have been have been ordained specifically and have a certain level of training, which would be equivalent to an empowerment. Yeah. I see. Um... I, I don't know if you're if you're familiar with the there's also because there's I know this um a deity, uh, there's this one called um, Fudo Myo O. Is, yes. that, is that one of them? No, no Fudo, Fudo Myo is, is not one of the, it's a radical deity, but it's not one that's typically hidden. It's typically normally shown. Let, let's take another question, maybe from Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Glenn. Thank you, you had, you had your hand up. Yeah, my question is about your explanation to a social phenomenon, which is of all the developed countries, Japan has produced the least number of psychologists, while US produced the highest number of psychologists. So when you talked about Haraji, uh, Haraji um, the spirituality is considered an uh, issue. So I wonder whether this spirituality, ten tenacity of the Japanese um, is a reason to explain 
why Japan has not been dependent on the psychology like other developed countries. Okay, thank you, Fenrir. That, that's, that's an interesting question. It's one that I've actually studied quite a bit. And uh, I might give you a um, mm -hmm. reference for that and it's by Anoki Tierney on illness in Japan. Okay. Uh, but it's interesting that one of the indigenous systems of psychotherapy in Japan is called the Morita therapy. And Morita lived be beside his uncle's temple. His uncle was a Zen monk and developed uh, Morita therapy from a Buddhist background. Now, without, I could be a medical anthropologist and become didactic as to why that may be, but I'll, I'll avoid doing that at the moment. Uh, just to say that the way Japanese people view neuroses and psychoses is different than the way it is viewed in the West. Okay. And I'll use a very, very quickly, because we don't have that much time, very quickly, Marita, and I'll use Marita as an example. Marita would claim that what is referred to as neuroses is something that is brought onto people by themselves, but done to people, i.e. Uncle Fred dropped you on your head. As a result, you have this particular, let's say, neuroses. Marita would argue that what we think of as neuroses is actually dukkha. And furthermore, that the way to, it's not something that you can cure. It's something that you um, learn to over, uh, learn to adapt to. And furthermore, and I'm not gonna get into all the specifics of this now, but furthermore, part of the notion is it's not something to cure, it's something to learn from. And it's maintained from Marita that the reason that you see so many people with neurotic tendencies in the West is due to lack of gratitude. And so Marita therapy is based upon instilling gratitude within the individual rather than seeking to answer why you are the way you are because of someone else. So, and I, I think that that's, that's really not a, a, a sufficient answer to your question. And maybe we could talk about that sometime, but that's yeah. part that's part of the dynamics of it. But you're you're absolutely right. Uh, there's probably there are probably more uh, psychologists and psychiatrists in Albany County <laughs> than there are in Japan. <laughs> and, and you do find psychiatrists because people still have have uh, neurological problems that are organic. And so you still have psychiatrists in Japan, MDs who treat uh, organic issues, but you don't have people going to psychotherapists to the same degree. I'm, okay. I'm, looking, yeah, I'm looking forward to a, a specific lecture from you. And okay. given your background in anthropology and medical and uh, your Japanese culture, I, I'd be very much interested in hearing your lecture. I'll, I'll put it down someday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to ask the people who are here now to go on out to the condo and bear with us just for a moment while they do that. I'll be with you this evening and uh, Koshin is going into the hondo to lead the people in the hondo. <laughs> so what we do is we have a tag team going on here this evening. And by the way, Fengiro, what you're, what you were describing, um, I actually spent quite a quite a while doing the research on that, so I'd love to do a, a talk on it some evening. I, I think people might find it might find it interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody have a, a final question before I move along? One one more question. Yeah, say again, please go ahead. So my question would be. How should we explain the Medicine Buddha to people who are new to him, so spe specifically to scientifically minded and skeptical people who might see the Medicine Buddha as a superstition? I would explain to them that the Medicine Buddha uh, is a way to empower uh, the healing power of the body 
of which many other systems are based upon, that it's, that it's not a superstition at all. It's using the, the body's power to heal itself in this much the same way that my osteopath uses <laughs> his power to heal me. Or an MD gives me a pill of a certain color because I know that that's going to help me. Um, 80% of what happens when I take that pill is due to the placebo effect, which is a documented positive uh, way for the body to deal with, deal with things. That's, that's how I'd respond to that. Okay. Thank you, Moshe. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to move us along and let me just check one thing here. Okay. Um, and I'm going to move us along and I will mute every, everyone in just a moment. The fourth of the Four Noble Truths is Marga, the path leading to renouncement of craving and unwholesome desires, and cessation of dukkha. The path is the noble eightfold path of Buddhism. And by tradition, this is one of the earliest teachings. Aryastan Maga, the Noble Eightfold Path, is comprised of eight primary teachings that Buddhists follow and use in their everyday lives. These eight areas of practice are not separate steps to master one at a time. The practice of each part of the path supports the other parts. The path is divided into three main sections, wisdom, ethical conduct, and mental discipline. This evening, I want to address the first, which is right views or right understanding, samyak drishti, along with right thought or intent. This is part of the wisdom path. The word translated from Sanskrit as right is samyak, meaning wise, wholesome, skillful, and ideal. It's something that is complete and coherent. And the word right is not a commandment. In a formal sense, right view is to be free of deluded thinking. It is a mean to gain the right understanding of reality. Through awakening, one becomes aware that nothing can be expressed in a fixed conceptual term. And I'd like to point out that often when we hear some things such as right, right view, right intent, right speech, et cetera. We take these to, to be a kind of commandment. And that's, as I said, that's not really what they are. Also, we have to recognize that when we talk about being free of deluded thinking, we are undergoing deluded thinking most of the time. And so to be free of deluded thinking is actually goes back to the notion of the Four Noble Truths. Often the basic teachings are the most difficult to truly understand. And I think that's true with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. And so right view is ultimately to understand and embrace the Four Noble Truths, that life is dukkha, that dukkha is caused by craving and desires, unwholesome desires, and that there's a way out of that condition, that attachment, and that way is the Eightfold Noble Path. Sounds so simple, and yet it's so difficult to really grasp. Now, I'd like to quote the recently deceased Thich Nhat Hanh, who wrote, our happiness and the happiness of those around us depend on our degree of right view touching reality deeply, knowing what is going on inside and outside of ourselves is the way to liberate ourselves from the suffering that is caused by wrong perceptions. Right view is not an ideology, a system, or even a path. It is insight we have into the reality of life, a living insight that fills us with understanding, peace, and love. And that's from the heart of Buddhist teachings by Thich Nhat Hanh. 
right view, as previously described, means to become less deluded and understand the nature of reality. In order to do that, we must drop our conceptualizations and we must adjust our attitude. Traditionally, this is done by reflecting on our current views, our beliefs, and our opinions, reformatting many of our attitudes as we go through life. We gain these attitudes from our parents, our friends, education, cultural influences. We all know where we get them. Do, you, do your views tend to enhance or limit you? Consider whether your views are conducive to a compassionate life. Some attitudes foster positive directions while others work against us. More importantly, what do our attitudes and our opinions add or subtract from all the sentient beings around us? Those we see and those we can't see. When we begin walking, on the path of the Noble Eightfold Path, we begin to take a different view of the world and of ourselves. As you've heard me say many times before, the Buddhist path is a search for the nature of reality. This is the first of the Noble Eightfold Paths, Svaha. And with that, I will give us a quote from Suzuki Shunru. It is a big mistake to think the best way to express yourself is to do whatever you want, acting however you please. This is not expressing yourself. If you know what to do exactly and you do it, then you express yourself fully.